Rachel Barenbaum, author of A Bend in the Stars. And today I'm here with debut author Max Gross, whose first book, The Lost Shuttle, is amazing. I absolutely loved it. It's funny. Max, tell me, what is the book about? The book is about a, a little village of Jews uh, in Eastern Europe who are very remote and isolated, like a lot of the old towns of Eastern Europe used to be. Um, that, and they were so old, or they were so isolated, so hermetic, uh, that during World War II, they're completely overlooked by the Nazis and they're completely overlooked by the Soviets in the, uh, the Cold War. And they're uh, rediscovered in the here and now. Um, so the way I'm describing it to people is a Yiddish brigadoon. The book is about a village, a lost village that is brought into the modern world. But I think that you could talk about another metaphor there too, which is the idea of putting your head in the sand, not wanting to enter the modern world. Can you talk about that juxtaposition and what you were thinking as you were writing this? Well, sure. I, one of the things that appealed to me about the idea was that I thought it was a good metaphor for um, the way people deal with modernity and the way people deal with uh, the current world. Uh, and one of the things that I showed in the book is that people have very different reactions to it. There are some people who, are, who embrace it, who see you know, all of the good things that come with um, the modern world. And I certainly believe that uh, there are good things. And then there are certain people who retreat into a kind of nostalgia, a kind of like you know, um, going backwards trying to recapture what, what once was um, and hold on to it. Uh, and um, I think that that's one of the central questions that a lot of people deal with today in not just in America, but everywhere around the world. So I have to ask, did you see the movie American Pickle? Ah, I have not seen this movie. Um, I, <laughs> I, I have a- You uh, must, you must. Oh my I, God. I, 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 you know, it's funny. There was a movie that came out about um, the O.J. Simpson case, like about a, a couple of years ago, like a, a miniseries on FX. And mm -hmm. at the exact same time, uh, Ezra Edelman, who's a documentary filmmaker, was making this like six part series about uh, the O.J. Simpson case. And they asked him, like, did you see the, the OJ case on FX? He's like, no, why not? <laughs> I, I don't want to see what they did and what I left out, what I, what I messed up. <laughs> um, well, so, so one of my favorite lines from that movie is the main character says he looks around and, you know, he's basically been trapped 100, you know, in his village 100 years ago. He's been pickled right. for 100 years. He comes out and he says, I don't understand what's going on. Mm. Right? And there's this question of, do we understand what's going on? What do you think? No, well, I don't think anybody, I mean, to a certain extent, the book was like, was a tri time travel piece. Mm -hmm. you, you step out and, you know, the world is completely absurd. Um, not just technology, not just um, the way people live now, but just the sweep of history in general. Uh, when uh, one of the main characters is told about the Holocaust, he, he, he just doesn't believe it because it sounds just so incredible that this would happen. And when people are, when the townspeople are told about the founding of the state of Israel, um, they, they hear the story and they say, so Ben Gurion, he's the Messiah? Like, because they figure that, that, that's what they have been told was that someday the Jews would return to Israel and, uh, there would be a great catastrophe beforehand and that sounded like the Holocaust. And they were like, oh, so Ben Gurion is the Messiah. And so all the things that were, that they had been preparing for mentally happened. <laughs> so, um, but just in a completely different way than anybody had been expecting. So I think that all the things that, you know, the, the way that things shake out and shape us are uh, completely baffling and perplexing. And, <laughs> Part of the book is the way people deal with those kinds of crazy uh, questions. Now, I, I, I should tell you, Rachel, that um, Seth Rogen and American Pickle, I did write one slim humor book. It wasn't a novel, but a slim uh, humor book in 2008 called uh, From Schlub to Stud, which was, and I'm not even joking about this, all about how I look like Seth Rogen and what that did for my dating life. 
And I, I'd written, I was working for the New York Post at the time. And an editor, I mentioned there casually to an editor there, oh, this movie Knocked Up is going to do wonders for my dating life. And she was like, you should totally write that up. And I wrote it up and a publisher <laughs> called me and I did like a quickie little memoir about it. And that. did it? Did it do wonders for your dating yeah, life? Well, so the fun, so what I did with this story was I went to Bryant Park with a photographer and went up to attractive women and asked them, did you see this movie, Knocked Up? And if they said, yes, I said, well, what'd you think of him? If they said, I liked him, they, I, I, I said, well, well, what would you go out with him? If they said, yes, I would hold up a picture of him next to me. And I said, what about me? And uh, I got a couple of numbers out of it. <laughs> <laughs> That was, oh my God, you see, you have me crying. <laughs> this was well before I met Mrs. Gross, my, my current wife. So I just want to stay the happily married man. Seth Rogen had, has no more impact on my dating life, but he apparently has some impact on my literary life still. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I read an interview in which you said you despise nostalgia. I loved that. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> I do. Um, well, it's all a lie. I mean, like, you know, when you say the good old days, the good old days sucked. I mean, you know, God, I think about like, you know, what I would have been like a hundred years ago without air conditioning. And I would have been the crankiest, most unhappy person in the world. <laughs> Which is not to say that, um, that there aren't myths that are, that are, that are beautiful and that, you know, provide so much bedrock of culture and, 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 and all the things that give us a lot of meaning. But um, I, I do think that nostalgia is largely false and it's uh, based on something that isn't quite real. I, I remember my childhood a lot differently than it probably happened. <laughs> language plays a big role in the book. Uh, one of the main characters struggles with language. She can't learn English, Pesha, when she goes to America. And also you have a lot of Yiddish in the book. Of course, there are all sorts of layers of meaning in language and not being able to understand language. I would love to hear you talk about how you thought about language as you wrote this book. Well, I, I just want to say about uh, Pesha, um, I'm Pesha when it comes to languages. Like I have <laughs> absolutely no facility for them. I, I, when I was a kid, I um, was in, in French class. I, I took French for six years and in the sixth year, my parents came in to parent-teacher night and they said, we're Max Gross's parents. And the teacher was like, Max Gross, he's such a nice boy, so stupid when it comes to French. <laughs> so, so Pesha was based on me in that respect. In terms of the Yiddish, I mean, it's, I, I really wanted this to be a folk tale. This, this, was, this was really a, a, a fairy tale, a folk tale told at the market between you know, people and the, the words that they would drop in, I just wanted to, to go in seamlessly. And um, in the first drafts that I gave to people, they were like, well, I couldn't follow it because there was too much in it. And <laughs> so I end up doing like these little translations at the bottom and, and doing a glossary. Um, and I, I don't know whether that worked or not, but in the first versions of the book that went out, I got rejected. Then when Harper got it, they got it with the, um, <laughs> the little glossary at the end and the little footnotes. So it did better. Um, but I have always been very interested in Yiddish as a literature, Yiddish as a language. I just heard the, the little you know, sprinklings of it that every, I think, Jewish boy in New York hears, maybe a little bit more for me than for most others. Um, what was the hardest thing? What did you struggle with the most as you were writing The Lost Shtetl? Well, I would say that there were two things. Uh, just getting, I, I, it was a very, very long time from the, like, the seed of the idea being dropped in my head about like, you know, this plot to actually writing, um, to actually thinking of the characters and thinking, okay, this is going to be how it's going to unfold. So there was like so many false starts that took so long that I don't even think about it now because it was like like a, a year of just like, you know, how do I start this book? And like, you know, try, typing out some things and just being like, that stinks. And then, and then finally um, settling on Pesha and uh, they, the, the opening chapter is all about her divorce. 
um, which I thought was a very, you know, interesting little like lightning bolt into this town that could, you know, break open everything. Um, the other part that was really difficult for me was I finished a draft back in 2014. Um, and I couldn't quite get an agent as a result of that draft. I think it was, you know, probably about 60% of what the book is currently. Uh, but one agent did take the time to give me her notes in detail. She was like, I, I, I really like the book, but I think that you, um, took a couple of like detours here, here, and here. And, um, this is what I think you should fix. And it really did take me about two years before I got back to those edits. <laughs> uh, getting down to serious revision was very difficult. And do you have any advice for new or aspiring writers, other debut authors? Um, my advice would be, and somebody asked me this recently, and I, I really do believe it. I think that writing is more craft than art. I think that um, writing, you know, I believe in inspiration and I believe that there are, you know, really, really brilliant writers out there, but I also, you know, who, and who knows, everybody's different. I, I just know for myself that um, so much of it is about perspiration and really putting in the hours to really, really think and rethink and rethink and rethink again. So my advice is to get up early every day and, you know, give yourself a, a few hours that you know you will devote to this and just, you know, even if you're writing your name on the page, you know, 300 times, just sit and do it and think about it. So. Max, thank you so much for joining me today. I love the book, The Lost Shadow. May you sell many, many copies. Great. Thank you. Thank you.